This morning, this is celebrating, isn't it? But you know, every Sunday when we meet together, every time we meet in one of the homes, when we get together, we have something to celebrate. So it happens to be on the calendar, Easter Sunday, but it's every day we get to celebrate. So I thought it would be nice, though, to do, it feels very echoey. <laughs> thought it would be nice to do something a bit different this morning. So... I did notice some adult hands go up when they thought there were Easter eggs on offer. Um, I know what you lot are like. So this morning, there is chocolate. To, chocolate in the house to be achieved for answers to the quiz. So we have a... We, 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 have a, we have a celebratory quiz that's going to be mixed up within what I'm going to present and share with you today. Um, just before I start, a first chance to uh, win some chocolate. Gina is going to be my um, handsome assistant. Um, first hand up, what year is it? <laughs> so Ju Julie's hand was up, but what, what, what was it, 1994? I'm sorry, that doesn't win you chocolate. Quick hand, but wrong answer. <laughs> okay, I, I wonder who was second. Barbara. I'll oh, go on then. <laughs> Take it to Barbara and ask her. 2024. You know, we all know the year. <laughs> but I think we can take for granted that the whole of this world runs its calendar on the coming of Jesus. This event that we're sharing and talking about today, our whole world turns on. And those of us that believe have seen something even bigger. For every non-believer out there, it's absolutely affected by the coming life, death and resurrection of Jesus. So that is what we celebrate in this morning been told look at your work. So we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. But Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, and if Christ is not alive, you are still lost in your sins and your faith is a fantasy. It would also mean that those believers in Christ who have passed away and sim have simply perished. If the only benefit of our hope in Christ is limited to life on earth, we deserve to be pitied more than all others. But the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead. You know, this is truth. It, it, we're not believing in a legend or a story tale or a good set of ideas. We're believing in the truth. Therefore, we are to be envied, not pitied. Our lies should say, look at what we've got, because we have the truth. But 
what I thought I would do is just have a little quiz to establish some of the reasons why we believe this is true. So, the first quiz for you, question is coming up. <laughs> you, you, you've not seen the answers. <laughs> so, you're going to have a choice of A, B, or C. Okay? Are you feeling active? Are your arms working? Because you're going to vote A with your right hand in the air. You're going to vote B with your hand on your head. And you're going you're gonna to vote C with your finger on the nose. Julian's watching. No changing when you know the answer. Well, I, I will tell the answer before you have to give the sweeties out. Okay, so we all know that our Bible is made up of lots of different books. We're going to concentrate on the New Testament today. So we're in the New Testament. So I've just chosen three books for the, for the quiz. Was Matthew written first? Or was it Mark? Or was it... <laughs> Or was it Corinthians? You've got to vote A, B, or C. No prizes for shouting out. A, B, C. Okay. So, we have a lot of votes for Matthew. Well, no, a few for Matthew and a few for Mark. Has anybody voted for Corinthians? Give that man a chocolate. So there you go. So the books, the books in our Bible and our New Testament are not set out in date order. And so the books we call the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses and collected eyewitness statements for the life of Jesus. And, and what historians and scholars believe is that these were written, well, Mark, the first of the Gospels, they believe was written around AD 66. So we're talking about 30 years after Jesus died. And so it's believed that the guy that wrote Mark might have been called John Mark, and he was the son, probably, well, he was the son of Mary. It wasn't hard to be a son of Mary. There were a lot of Marys in those times. He was the son of Mary, but Mary was one of Jesus' disciples. And it's believed that Peter and the early church met in Mary's house. And Peter probably asked John Mark to, can you write this down? We need to know and remember. And so John Mark will have gone to his mum, who was around, who witnessed and saw these things, and to all the other people. So it was probably written about 30 years after Jesus' death. Now, I know if I was an eyewitness to those things, I would not forget. If someone came and asked me, Andrew, you know when you were in Manchester in your 20s, and that guy came along and raised somebody from the dead, can you tell me what happened? I would not have forgotten. And so that's what happened. And that's how we got the book of Mark. So those things were written down for Peter, who was going out evangelizing and telling people about what Christ had done and what Jesus had done. But Corinthians was written before those books. So Corinthians is a letter that was written by Paul to churches. And um, we think that Corinthians was probably written A.D. 53 to 54. But a lot of the letters were written even sooner than that. So, the disciples start spreading the gospel. Paul becomes convinced of Jesus. And he starts spreading the gospel and establishing churches and writing to those churches and telling them how to live. And then, I say, we, we don't want this to be forgotten. 
because in those days there weren't many writers. There definitely weren't any books as we know them or any printing presses or any photocopiers. These were handwritten by the people who had those skills to write. It wouldn't have been that many people. But those people had what they call a really strong oral tradition. That's how they learned. So the Jewish boys, when they went off to learn, will be taught by rabbis in the synagogue. And it wasn't uncommon for 12-year-olds to know word for word the Torah. From Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's how they worked. That's how they remembered things. Um, and so that's how we can trust what we have, because those people remembered the things that were taught. And then they were written down and distributed among churches. It wasn't until much, much later that they were gathered together and put into a New Testament. Um, yeah. And so we've been learn we've been reading from Mark now. Is it since Christmas? Yeah. So we've learned about Jesus. We've learned he taught about the kingdom of God. We've learned that he healed people, that he raised the dead that he did miracles and fed crowds on small portions. He walked on water and he calmed storms. We've learned that he was no ordinary man. We know that he's an inspired teacher, but he was more than that. And we've heard him say, I am the Son of God. And that's what got him in trouble. His shoes were not fashioned. And that's what led up to his crucifixion. This is where we got to last week. So we're going to be picking up that story. But just to change a little bit of my point, I've got another quiz question for you. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you how many ancient writers document Jesus? So these are historians who have written about Jesus from that time. By ancient, I mean how many people wrote about the life of Jesus up to about AD 150. So we're talking 1,800 years ago. How many people had written in that period about the life of Jesus? Written about in historically, but that also includes biblical texts and books. So how many writers? Are... No, not prophets. Oh. He's getting really deep. <laughs> she wants a chocolate. <laughs> okay, remember how we vote? Hand up for A, hand on your head for B, finger on your nose for C. Julian is watching. I hope you get some more, right? Or I'm going to take mine and eat more. So, is there one? Are there nine? Come on, vote if you're voting. I think there might be some copying going on. Okay, if you give a chocolate to everyone with a finger on their nose. Yay, well done. Okay, yeah. Oh, are you going to help? So, um, for, for the scholars and academics among you, you can find me afterwards and I'll give you my references. So, there's not 100% agreement, but most historians believe there are about 45 documents, letters, accounts of the life of Jesus. We're having too much fun. The kids never went out. This is true. So, I put the 
the number nine there as a choice, because actually, gentle is easier. Because of those 45, nine are from sources that aren't Christian. So nine are from Jewish historians, Roman writers. So these people that have written about Jesus are not just the people that followed him and believed in him. And to give you a bit more context, at the time, the the leader, the Roman leader, was a guy called Tiberius. We know about him because I think it's in Luke. We talk about he's the one who asked for the census. And of Tiberius, in total, there are nine accounts of his life. So if we compare that, there are nine non-Christian accounts of Jesus and a total of 45 and only nine of Tiberius. Um, and if we go forward to an emperor we all will have heard of, Nero, the mad one, there are even less accounts. So that just makes us think Jesus was causing a stir and getting noticed. As far as historians are concerned, Jesus was born, did live, and did have followers. We're not believing in a myth or a legend, or a story. One more question. I hope hope we're not going to run out of sweet tea, but I have got some gold coins. Okay. So, for these Gospels and letters to be shared, somebody had to copy. So if, if, if John Mark's there in Jerusalem and he's written it all down, and Paul says, I want that to go to Corinth. Someone has to sit and copy it and send it to Corinth. Someone has to sit and copy it and send it to other places. So all the places that Paul and Peter and James' followers went and churches were planted and wanted copies of these books and of these letters. So talking about the New Testament writings as a whole, how many copies physical copies, not the full documents, but parts of the documents, do you think have been physically found? Tens of copies? Hundreds of copies? Or thousands of copies? A, B, C. Are you watching, Julian? You might have to get those coins. Okay, so... Everyone, again, with a finger on the nose, you are going to get a sweetie. Yeah. Put these in. If you're desperate and you've not had one so far, wave your hand like mad. Julian might prioritise you. So actually, over 5,000 copies in Greek alone have been found. But also, those early Christians in the 1st and 2nd century took the Gospels to Syria, to Ethiopia, out across the Latin lands, and there are translations in those languages too. So if you can just get your mind around that, in a time when there weren't documents collected. It is unprecedented what we know about the life and teachings of Jesus. And if anybody asks you, you can now tell them. This is not not some story. This is not weak evidence. I'm not a bit feeble-minded. We know these things. They stand up in proper universities with proper historians. Okay. Oh, I've gone back. Okay. Thankfully, that's the last of the questions and we've not run out of chocolate. So, let's go to Mark 
I need this, knowing this is a historical account. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they may go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will move the stone from the entrance for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. But he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples and Peter, who is going ahead of you, into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene at the tomb he had given seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for the lack of faith and left seven with Jesus to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Let's think about this. Jesus has been with his followers. He's taught them. Not only has he done miracles and signs and wonders, not only has he said, I'm the Son of God, he's told them that he's going to die, and he's told them he's going to rise again three days later. And I think for me, I think, he really didn't get it. No one believed. He's been following this guy around for years. He's been telling everybody about him. And then what he told you was going to happen, happens. And you don't believe. And I think I'm going to be kind to them. Because I'm not sure I would. Because this is out of our human understanding, isn't it? I mean, I know they've seen miracles and healings, but this is just so different. These three ladies that are described in Mark's account were really lucky. And they were distraught. And they were going to anoint his body. They were going to do the best they could for him. He got there and he was risen. He wasn't there. There was an angel telling them. And it, it just, it's not story. This really, really happened. And wow. But maybe you're not as convinced as I am. Or maybe you believe, but when your friends challenge you, you go, oh, it was a bit. The man was dead and then he was alive. So what I want to do is share with you 
some evidences, some reasons we believe. Ben told us about the women last week. And it's not very nice, really, for us in our uh, 21st century. But in those days, women really were treated like second-class citizens. Um, You know, women weren't even allowed to give evidence in court. So if women seen an event and people were being brought before the court, the women's evidence was inadmissible in those Jewish courts. And here we are at the resurrection of Jesus and God has chosen women to be the witnesses. You know, it's how God works. He doesn't care about our culture and our society and the way we think things should be done. Jesus chose. It would have been quite easy for Jesus to choose somebody else. You know, he was Jesus was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. You know, Joseph was a well-to-do, well-respected man. His testimony would have been believed. Or Nicodemus, who, along with Joseph, had laid Jesus' body in the tomb. He was a Jewish leader. He was more likely to be believed, but yet God chose these Mary, Mary and Salome, as we hear in Mark, to be the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And you know, if anyone says to you, well, yeah, of course, of course the Gospels are going to say that because they believe. If the Gospel writers were making things up, they wouldn't have made up ladies. They would have made up somebody else. That's a really strong evidence that this is true. And the stone. <laughs> when they buried people in those times, they buried them in, in caves, basically. And they would close the cave with a stone. Any idea of how big the stone would be? Big. <laughs> so huge. Massive, yeah. That it, it's likely that the stone closing the cave was at a minimum six foot, probably eight foot, and it, it weighed more than Julian. <laughs> yeah. So some people suggest they were like corkscrew shaped. But it could have been rolled up. It would have been at least as tall as Julian, and it probably would have weighed about 20 Julians. I reckon one to two tons of small car. And it would take at least two strong, thick guys to budge that stone. And yet, the women turned up, and the stone was moved. And what's more, there was no body. And again, people may question, well, all kinds of rumors were started because the Jewish leaders weren't very happy (laughs) that Jesus had risen, as he said. And so they, they said, well, someone's stolen the body. But the thing is, they were in Rome. Rome didn't want all this insurrection. The Jewish leaders were powerful. If there was a stolen body, those guys would have found it and would have quashed the rumours. But nobody was ever found. There is no evidence to suggest that this was a hoax or a fraud. The evidence says the stone was rolled away and Jesus' body wasn't there. I want to tell you about James. James is Jesus' brother. Now, you know, <laughs> James was a bit sceptical. I don't know if you're the younger brother and you grow up. 
can you bring brothers out there telling everybody that he's actually the son of God, doing miracles. And But James was a really devout Jew. In fact, James got the name later on, or a nickname. He had a couple of nicknames. He got called James the Just. Um, and he also got known for his novelly knees, evidently, because he spent so much time to pull in the camel because he would be praying on his knees. He was a guy who loved God and was Jewish through and through. And he was not at all convinced about his brother. In fact, we read about um, Jesus' mum and his brother turning him up and when he's getting into trouble for what he's preaching, they're trying to say, come on, come home, stop this. So this skeptical guy ends up becoming a leader in the church. He ends up writing in, in our Bible, the book of James. And do you know why that was? Because he saw the risen Jesus. So in Corinthians we read that James saw Jesus risen. This guy completely changed seen Jesus. And we know we've got historic specimens. He doubted and he turned around. He changed his life. And he gave his life to share the good news. What about our friend Peter? I feel a bit sorry for Peter. I have a feeling if I'd have been around, I'd have been a bit of a Peter. <laughs> I'd have been there. I'll do it! <laughs> Oh, this is a bit scary. <laughs> but that's what happened. Peter was all in. But when the crucifixion came, three times he said, nothing to do with me. And yet, this is the guy who gets up and preaches the gospel. The Holy Spirit is poured out. This is the guy who writes books, who travels the world, who establishes it. This is a guy who once was scared, who stood firm in Rome and died. Some people say crucified. Some people say crucified upside down. He gave his life for Jesus. And that's, again, because he saw the resurrected Jesus. That's what changed him. He wouldn't have changed on a made-up story, on a false hope. He changed on the reality of encountering the raised Jesus. So we've got a sceptical Jew. We've got a devastated follower. And we've got Paul, an out-and-out persecutor. I don't know if you know the story of Paul, but he used to be called Saul. And he was a Jew of Jews. He was learned and educated. And he was not at all impressed that Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God. He was even less impressed by the stories of his resurrection. And so he, he spoke to the Jewish leaders and said, send me to Damascus. I'm going to break up these groups of people who are claiming that Jesus is risen. I'm going to persecute them. I'm even going to have them tried and murdered. Saul stood there while Stephen, a follower of Jesus, stoned, slain in Christ. But Saul, we, we read about shortly in Acts 9, he's on his way to Damascus. And he's blinded by a great light. And he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asked, who are you, Lord? And Jesus replied, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Saul sees the risen Jesus and his mouth turns around. And he preaches and he teaches and he writes so many of the letters in our New Testament. In fact, it says in 
verse 22, chapter 9, about Paul. He battled the Jews living in Damascus by proving Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, you might be baffled. I'd be baffled. He's had a complete turnaround with an encounter with Jesus. Creed. I've heard that word, and you hear the word creed, and I think of, I don't know how to say this politely, ringing incense and bells. And, but a creed is basically a statement of shared belief. It's really important, and it's how, in the early days following Jesus' death, the believers in Jesus would learn and understand their faith and would share their faith. So there would be statements. Um, of belief. And there's many of them throughout the New Testament. And they are, there's one in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, some in Acts, some in Luke, in Philippians. And these creeds have been dated back to the AD 30. So this is how they were learning and teaching. Now we've got them recorded for us, but they would meet and they would say them together. So this is one of the most famous ones from Paul. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And these are the, this is now what people who are following Jesus are repeating. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Paul and the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom he was still living. Some had fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me. What Paul started doing, as soon as he had realized that Jesus was alive and this was the truth, he started proclaiming it and teaching it. And this is the foundation what we believe, that Jesus died, as we told about him in the Old Testament, that he was buried, as we told about him in the Old Testament through the Torah, and that he was raised on the third day. And this was being taught across all, all different forms of word. Jesus is risen. Ah. Oh. So you don't know the creed. Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. That's how they would greet one another. Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. There's no doubt. There's no holding back. So we know these things. But what I want you to get, oh, experience or fear, I'm just you now. And, and just in case those truths aren't enough for you, or aren't enough, for your friends. There are, I don't know, millions of Christians across this world who believe and experience Jesus. Look at us here. I don't know how many we are. 40. Who all say, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. We're not mad. We're not making it up. We can point to one another's lives. We can point to answered prayer. We can point to hope, to love, to community. Jesus is alive. But now what? Now what? Because for your friends that don't believe, they don't really have an option of saying, yeah, he was a good man. He had some good thoughts. Because no, he wasn't. If what he said wasn't true, he was mad or bad. But he was not mad or bad. 
who Jesus, the Son of God, is. So we should challenge ourselves and one another. Is Jesus who he said he was? Is he the Son of God? Is he risen from the dead? And so if you believe that, if you accept, then you have to do something. You need to become a disciple. You need to become a follower of Jesus Christ, a learner from Christ. Now, I've put a Christian at the end, because I think we all feel that we should say to people, become a Christian. Well, what does become a Christian mean? What is a Christian? You know, all these people that we've talked about today in the first and second century, they weren't initially called Christians. Christians was a nickname that other people gave them because they followed Jesus. So, if I believe, I want people to look at me and go, follow Jesus. I'm happy with the tag Christian, but it doesn't really... Am I what the tag says? Am I what it says on the tin? Because if I'm a Christian, that doesn't mean I mentally assent. It doesn't mean Yes, I do believe that. It doesn't mean I go to church on a Sunday, well, most Sundays. Or, do you know what, I even go to home group and prayer meetings. It's not about that. It's about following Jesus. There was a word there in the song that talks about, to you, my soul, I surrender. Everything I am. Everything we believe and do and the way we live surrender to Jesus. Are we following his teaching? Are we trying to live like him? Are we learning from him? And, and that's what we should be challenging our long distance friends. It's not, yeah, invite them to church, of course, but it's not about church. It's about believing that Jesus Christ is the risen Son of God and that he's worth following. Worth chasing after with our whole heart. He's worth giving everything up for. And when we've done that, we're called to make a change because it doesn't stop with us. When we surrender all to Jesus, then we want what we see. Oh, he's the risen Son of God. He died for our sins to be forgiven. Why on earth would we not want to share that? You know, I can find myself mentally assenting. And then I get there with my non-Christian friends and think, I don't know, I think I'm mad. It does not matter. My reputation, I want to surrender to Jesus. Because the only thing that matters is Christ and glorifying him and serving him and following him. Um, I really hope, pray, that you enjoyed the chocolate, but that you're challenged. I challenge myself this week and I think, am I a Christ follower? Am I out to other people to follow Christ? Um, do, is that everything? I think it's great just to think on those things while we finish off worshipping with another song.